All right, my name is Akram Khatir. I'm a professor of history here at North Carolina State University, and I'm the director of the newly established Moiz Khairallah Center for Lebanese Diaspora Studies. On behalf of the center, I would welcome you all here, and thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening to listen to uh, Mr. Joe Jaha, who is a Lebanese-American novelist, who will be speaking about his experience as an immigrant, as well as about his novel, The Lebanese Blonde. Before we start, and I give a full introduction about uh, Joe, I'd like to ask you for a favor, turn off all your cell phones right now, please. All electronics, out of sight. No computers, no things like that, please. It's just out of respect that we are trying to have a community of conversation here, so those of you tend to be disruptive. Thank you so much for doing that. Second piece of information, bathrooms. If you need to use them, they're right here. But please don't come this way. <laughs> Go the other way around. So you're going to have to do a little you and come back, and there's a water fountain there as well. So uh, please help yourself if you need to go that way in this regard. Just go right ahead. If, you're, if you really, really have to go, yeah, by all means, just rush through us. Uh, secondly, uh, this event is being videotaped, but the only thing that you will see is the back of your head because the camera is up there and we're down here. So it will be posted on our website. So uh, that's another piece of information that you should have. Uh, and for those who are in classes, that are here because you really love learning, but also because you love extra credit. Uh, what I would ask for you is to wait after we're done. The event is about an hour and a half, 45 minutes talk, 45 minutes questions and answer. After the talk, those in my class and those in Ustaz Khatir's class who are taking Arabic, you're welcome to come up to us. We'll take your name. And yes, we will give you the extra credit. All right, so that's uh, the bit on that. Yes? Yes, this will be available. The whole thing will be available. So we will post it very quickly, probably by tomorrow or, t or Wednesday at, at the latest. And if you don't know where it is, it's lebanesestudies.ncsu.edu. That's the website. And we'll have a link to the, the tape. Okay? Any other house cleaning questions? We're all set? Okay. <coughs> so uh, it is absolutely a privilege. Uh, to introduce to you uh, Joseph Shahab. He was born in uh, the town of Zahli in the Bihar Valley in Lebanon uh, not too long ago. He was born in 1944 uh, and he was brought here as a child to Toledo, Ohio, which was a big center for Lebanese immigration uh, in the early part of the 20th century. I understand it's not so much anymore. Uh, he is a professor, or uh, used to be anyway, at Iowa State University before he retired. He retired way too early. Uh, he's very young. And he retired 10 years ago, so I want to emulate him when I grow up. He's author of two books, Through and Through, Toledo Stories, and one of the, which is one of the first books of modern Arab-American fiction. And his most recent novel that was published in 2012, which is called Lebanese Blonde, and that's not about the hair, it's about Lebanese hashish. But that's another thing altogether. <laughs> I understand it's very good, that's why they call it Lebanese Blonde. Anyway, uh, he has also published poems, plays, essays, short fiction, in periodicals and anthologies such as Esquire, Growing Up Ethnic in America, and the New York Times. Uh, Professor Jaha graduated from the University of Toledo in 1968 with an MA in English. Before coming to Iowa State in 1977, he taught English and creative writing at Missouri State University, Bowling Green State University, and the University of Toledo. He was awarded a fellowship at, uh, from the National Endowments for the Arts in 1988 and a Pushcart Prize in Fiction in 1990. His work was chosen for inclusion in the permanent collection Arab American Archive of the Smithsonian Institute, and he was named Arab American Book Award winner in 2013 for his novel, Lebanese Blonde. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jaha. Thank, thank you, Akram. Is it on? I think so. Is everything uh, on? Can you hear me okay? All right, good. good. <coughs> Bear with me. I'm uh, having uh, allergy problems here. Is there an us? The title of my talk today is a question that immigrants and the children of immigrants, whatever their heritage or national origin may be, must either answer for themselves or, in some cases, risk having answered for them. Do they belong to an us? Do they even want to? How do our answers apply to the age-old immigrant's dilemma that choice between family and the loss of freedom on one hand, and on the other hand, freedom 
and the loneliness that accompanies it. Uh, one way that uh, I can best explain this is back in Iowa, a lot of my students came from small towns. They came to Ames, which was a town of 50,000, and to them it was the big city. It was really big. And, and in a way, they were having an immigrant's experience. Uh, in fact, one I remember uh, standing on Duff Avenue, and there were just, Duff Avenue was nothing, just a couple of uh, storefronts and street lights, and the guy was standing there looking, and I heard him mutter to himself, look at all the lights. Look at all the lights. You know, and then I realized how dark it was where he came from. Uh, they, they described to me that back home, in their, such their small, small communities, you can walk in the hardware store if they have one, and you can buy a screwdriver. But first, you have to hear about the cashier's arthritis and her m grandmother's peach pie recipe. You got to stand there for 45 minutes before you can leave. Or in the big city, you can walk in, pay your money, take your screwdriver and leave, but you're not connected, you're alone. So the risk is connectedness and being smothered, possibly, or, and, and the other extreme, of course, is total non-connectedness and total freedom and loneliness that goes with it. Uh, and I think this is part uh, of the of the Arab, uh, excuse me, of the immigrant experience. But these are the questions I'd like you to consider during my talk tonight, which will consist primarily of a few selected readings from uh, my uh, fiction and, and nonfiction. And uh, they're readings that I think uh, address those questions. Uh, afterward, I'm happy to answer questions and, com and hear comments that you may have. My novel, Lebanese Blonde, is set primarily in Toledo, Ohio's little Syria neighborhood at the start of the 1975 uh, Lebanese Civil War. It's a coming-of-age story uh, blended with the often perplexing immigrant experience of adjusting to life in America. I have uh, one character who is primarily uh, the greenhorn to beat all greenhorns, who knows very little about this country but is determined to worm his way into it. And we have another one who uh, is so young, he needs a good dose of coming of age before he can face the world. Uh, it's a blend that works, I think, because uh, every immigrant story is a coming of age story. When we say a young man or a woman comes of age, we mean they discover their place in life, and they accept responsibility for where they came from and where they plan to go. In a way, the immigrant faces a similar dilemma. Uncle Yusuf, the character who opens my novel, introduces us to the immigrant's dilemma as he sees it with his very first words before we knew it. And this is the opening of the book. Before we know it. That was how Uncle Yusuf liked to begin his funeral homilies, with an American phrase he'd adopted to mean, once upon a time. Before we know it, the ship stopped in New York Harbor, he would announce to the congregation. And we stepped down on Ellis Island. Yusuf's voice was high-pitched, and he sprayed his S's. Step, Ellis. Children in the congregation tittered to see the spit fly, lifting their faces as they followed its arc up into the ceiling lights and then down again toward the casket, positioned directly beneath the pulpit between a double row of candle stands. The casket was kept open during the homily, awaiting the final administering of ashes and holy water. He first come here... Yusuf continued, pointing down at the silk-covered face. The same year McKinley was shot. Or, she come the year before McKinley died. Or, two years after. An assassination, rather than the turning of a century, was the hallmark by which an entire generation had signaled its arrival. 
settling into America, they grew old with the century. And as they grew old and began to die off one by one, Yusuf spoke at their funerals. Archdeacon of St. Elias Church, educated in the seminaries of Antioch and Damascus, and so almost a priest, he would recount in the formal intonations of high Arabic how, before we know it, ticket agents were riding up Mount Lebanon on donkey back, sent by steamship companies that needed people to fill their steerage holds. In village after village, from the Baka Valley in the north down to the mouth of the Latani River, they announced cheap passage. Just imagine it, America, where one finds gold lying in the streets. At the beginning, only a few bought tickets. Those few, anticipating the crash of the silk industry and understanding that nothing would be left for them after that, not even the work their fathers had done all their lives long, said to one another, Yalla, let's go. So they went the trickle before the flood. For those who remained, mail began to arrive from America. There were letters to be read aloud by those who could read, and there was something else in the envelopes. American dollars. Wallah, they had indeed struck gold. Here, Yusuf liked to pause, briefly raising both hands to his shoulders as if in benediction his tiny frame so compressed by age he could barely see over the pulpit's lectern. So the rest of us packed up what we could not sell off, and we followed. They never came here to stay. Yusuf stressed this. They came here to take the gold back with them and live out their days like pashas in the most beautiful mountains of the most beautiful country in all the world. But, he would add, the first step away takes you all the way away. So that in the end, who remembers the old country? He pondered his own question. Over the years, Yusuf's eyebrows and mustache had remained black while the hair of his head had turned iron gray. Forget the old country. You rolled up your sleeves instead. You learned the money first, then the language. Books and schools were for your children, not for you. America grasps you by the ankles of your children. Here Yusuf would fall silent, wait for the high, piping echo of his own voice to fade. That trip back to the old country you were planning to take in five years, before you know it, 10 years. Before you know it, 15. Before you knew it, a two-week charter tour in the summer excursion fair after your children had sold the store. With luck, you could make it back in time to die in the shadow of Mount Sunin under the grape arbor of the village where your family name was born. But even that is not the end. No, in the end, your children will send for your body, have it boxed up, and brought back to America to be buried. Your dust now American dust. Born in Lebanon and growing up in an Arab American community, uh, thinking my first thoughts in Arabic and speaking in Arabic, eating Arabic food, I was more than eager to do what Yusuf warns us about, to be swallowed up in America. As a young man, I wanted to blend in and be seen not as Arab or Arab-American, but only as American. Problem was, I looked different in those days. My olive skin was a way deeper olive than it is now, and I had a head full of very thick black curls, believe it or not. It's a picture of me with an afro that would scare anybody. And after I moved away to my first teaching job, first in Missouri and, the, and then in Iowa, strangers often felt compelled to ask me where I came from because I sure didn't look like I came from around here. They were polite as could be, but I still resented their asking. I described this experience in an essay called Where I'm From Originally, which I wrote about uh, my early years living in Iowa uh, back when I was a single father with two small daughters, 
One Sunday, I'd taken the girls to a carousel in a small town just north of Ames. Uh, yeah, they refurbished this enormous carousel, and I thought, well, I'll take the kids out for the afternoon. So the essay begins with this statement. You're not from around here, are you? The man had put it like a statement, but I recognized the question that was being implied. By that time, having lived around here for over a dozen years, I also knew that if I didn't answer as expected, I'd be leaving the door open for the outright questions that were certain to follow. Where are you from? And, no, but I mean where originally? Asked openly, I ought to add, in a friendly spirit. Even so, I wasn't used to it. I tried to answer with a simple smile. That's right, I said, and volunteered nothing more. I was just asking for trouble, of course. So, where are you from? I turned and faced the man fully now. Toledo, I told him, which I knew perfectly well wasn't at all what he was asking. He looked to be a nice sort, a youngish <coughs> grandfather. Why was I being so contrary? All he was doing was making small talk. It was a sunny autumn day, and here we'd found ourselves, two adults among children, my daughters, his grandkids, on a line at a county fair carousel in Iowa. The white crispness of the short sleeve shirt he had on, along with his hairless arms and clean, pink-tipped fingers, made me think maybe he was a dentist. That and his no-nonsense, persistent manner. Originally, he said, as if to specify. I answered, Ohio, Toledo, Ohio, pretending to specify too, since there was a Toledo, Iowa not far from here. I was behaving badly. Was it my fear of dentists? My frayed nerves from being with the kids all day? It was not as if this man's curiosity wasn't understandable. After all, I didn't look like I was from around here, here being a part of the country that was more familiar with a blonde Scandinavian Irish German mix than with the olive skin and black curly hair common to people from Lebanon. <coughs> Nor could he know <coughs> that I'd heard the question a lot around here. Excuse me. <clears throat> Nor could he know that I'd heard the question a lot around here, the last time only a few days before. This sounds like an exaggeration, but it really happened. I'd taken my daughter swimming, and a little blonde girl they'd made friends with at the pool kept glancing over at me out of the corner of her eye. I was in a bathing suit, and I'm fairly certain it was the body hair. Your dad's not from around here, is he? She stated, just as I dove underwater. Surfacing, I heard. No, I mean originally. In 1971, before the war in Lebanon, I visited Zahli, the town where I'm from originally. Although I'd brought my clothes locally, I was easily recognized, maybe from my manner, the way I walked, for an Americanized Lebanese. Even so, I still felt I fit in. The people looked as if they could be all of them members of my family. I could see where my sister got her classic dark beauty. The men looked like my brother, my father, me. I saw hair that grew in the same curly ward patterns as my own used to. Used to have it. I remember one small boy in particular dashing past me with a familiar, lopsided, just got in trouble grin that instantly brought to mind my own face as a child shortly after we came to America. Me grinning and saluting for the camera on the pavement in front of my father's newly opened grocery on Monroe Street in Toledo. I felt the same grin forming on my face as the dentist having helped his smallest grandchild onto a pastel pony, stepped down off the carousel to join me once more. No, he said, taking right up where he'd left off. No, I mean originally. He squinted a pale eye at me as if to underscore his persistence. Ah, you mean originally, 
The country of my origin, you mean? I was taking it too far. And I considered relenting. Back in the 60s, I used to save bus money by hitchhiking to my classes at Toledo University. I didn't find it strange that on the basis of my looks, the driver might begin talking to me in a foreign language, Greek, Yiddish, Italian, Spanish. Eventually, I learned to identify them all. In Toledo, with its ethnic mix, this wasn't unusual. My parents used to do it, calling out, Ibn Arab Inta, to any olive-complected fellow on the corner or in the car next to us at a stoplight, while my brother and sister and I slid groaning to the back seat floor, out of sight of the stranger's puzzled shrug. Now the dentist waited, and I could feel my grin widen as his eye unsquinted for my answer, which I delivered straight, deadpan. Norway. <laughs> he didn't call me a liar. Instead, he simply nodded his head. This was Iowa, heaven in the movies. And not only are the people nice, they have a hard time believing anyone else is not nice. But being an Iowan myself after all these years, I couldn't leave him like this. Besides, Iowa's a small world. What if I needed dental work someday? I pictured myself in the chair, helpless, and him and his business whites, pliers in hand. Norway? I'll give you Norway. So I took it all back, beginning with, not really. What I didn't tell him was that most of my life, child and adult, had been an attempted escape from my Arab roots, and that these innocent questions from dentists from my daughter's playmates were reminders that I hadn't yet blended in to the great American melting pot. My family left Lebanon and came to America at the end of World War II when I was still a toddler. We traveled by ship and underwent processing at Ellis Island. It wasn't until I started first grade that I began to speak English. So I remember feeling different at an early age and not liking the feeling. I was teased for my accent, for the garlicky smelling food in my lunchbox. I remember schoolmates calling me dirty Syrian, chasing me and yelling at me to go back where I came from. They didn't know any better. Being kids, they were slow to extend to humans the empathy they lavished on puppies and goldfish. When they eventually did know better, many of them would become the first friends I ever made. I remember, too, how American women made a fuss over my thick curls. I keep mentioning that, don't I, that I used to have hair. Uh, uh, in department store aisles, patting them fondly with their white glove palms. Of course, I was fully aware of how cute those curls were. But I also remember wanting those curls to be blonde. Because Americans, real through and through Americans, were blonde. They had blue eyes. And nobody would ever think to tell a blonde-haired, blue-eyed American to go back where he came from. During the first couple years of school, my accent faded. And I remember helping it along, mouthing Peter Piper and his peck of pickled peppers over and over on the long walks home. This is more than a tongue twister for Arabic speakers, since the language has no P sound. Perversely, this accomplishment seemed to only make me all that much more aware of my parents' heavy accents. Fixing a self-conscious gaze on my mother and father, I was ashamed at the way they haltingly massacred English in front of Americans who were, from my view, a very impatient finger-drumming lot. But I'd be absolutely mortified whenever they backslid into Arabic. After school, I wanted to eat only American food. I insisted that my mother make hamburger for dinner. And she, being a good sport, not only gave it a try, she figured to do hamburger one better. And so what I ended up getting was more like lamb burger, with garlic and parsley and vinegary onions ground into it. Couldn't she see that I didn't want better than hamburger? What I wanted was not to be different. I'd begun writing fiction while working nights in the stockroom at Sears and Roebuck and attending the University of Toledo on partial scholarship. Luckily, the first teacher I showed any of it to, 
Gregory Ziegelmeyer, a young playwright who was new to the English faculty, proved to be both kind and generous in his encouragement. For my first course with him, he urged me to begin taking my writing seriously. Sometimes I used to drop by his office hours just to chat about writing or usually or the advantages of one program of study over another. And because he seemed interested, I soon found myself telling him about my family, about my parents having had less than three years schooling between them, about my father being so superstitious he kept a piece of what he called the true cross wrapped in a bandage under his armpit. It looked like a little banana. I used that in the book. Claiming that if he lost it, he would lose all his luck. About my mother uttering startled blessings whenever I chuckled over something funny in a book. She never could understand how, outside of demonic possession, anyone staring at an inanimate object, a book, could suddenly be moved to laugh out loud. To her, it was because she didn't read. It would be like looking at a piece of wood and suddenly laughing. You know, she'd, think, you know, she'd start saying blessings on me because she was afraid I was being possessed by that piece of wood. It was a strange upbringing, I'll tell you. <laughs> Turns you into a writer, though, I'll tell you that. Another time I told him the story of how my father had tricked the steamship officials when my sister came down with typhoid the day before we were scheduled to sail from Beirut, rouging her fever yellow face and tickling her to alertness as we ascended the gangplank. And about how my whole family got stuck on an escalator Oh that, oh, that was an awful experience. In our first days here, the stairs in America just wouldn't stay still. Uh, we actually we got, we got processed through Ellis Island because my father had sneaked uh, uh, her through uh, with typhoid fever, and they discovered it on board ship. And then the entire ship sat in quarantine at Ellis Island for two weeks. A lot of people did not like us. And the childish childless, excuse me, and the childless Jewish couple who adopted our family. The trip to the art museum where we were told they have pictures on the walls and music that ended up with us listening to piped music on the lawn of a gas station that was celebrating a grand opening as plate glass windows painted with cartoon characters. My mom thought it was the museum. My teacher enjoyed these stories, and I had to admit that I liked telling them. So why, he wanted to know, wasn't he seeing any of this in my writing? Taking my writing seriously meant, of course, taking my experience seriously, too, including my immigrant heritage. But what he didn't understand was that to include such material would be to identify myself exactly with what I had been avoiding all my life. But. There's nothing like moving away from home to precipitate coming of age. Ask any immigrant. After I moved away to my first teaching job in Springfield, Missouri, a kind of change came over me. Instead of being eager to blend right in, I found myself holding back, realizing that I did want to be different after all, but on my terms. I didn't want to be made different. I wanted to be myself different. You see the difference? Meanwhile, during session after session at my writing table, my mind kept straying to images of my father's store on Monroe Street. I saw the apartment above the store and myself dark-eyed and olive-skinned looking like exactly what I was, an Arab boy in a Gene Autry cowboy hat. Peeking from behind the stuffed chair in our front room, watching my mother serve Turkish coffee to the aunt who wore two pairs of glasses on her nose at once and the uncle, who was so simple that even my brother and sister and I used to look at one another and wink. Now in Missouri, living far from those streets, and as if freed up by the distance, I found available to me the landscapes of my past. People, situations, places, all that I'd rejected while breathing the actual air of those landscapes. I began to take my professor's advice, that is, I began to take my Arab-American experience seriously, and to include it in my fiction. Fiction, as I tell my students, presents us with the opportunity to walk in someone else's shoes. And picturing the other guy, in this case the Arab-American immigrant, as a complex person 
with human frailties as well as human virtues defeats the possibility for sentimental simplifying, good or bad, white or black, us or them. Such a lesson is especially important today, today being when I wrote this essay, today being just after the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. Such a lesson is especially important today when the politically hot Middle East has turned even hotter, when Arab American businesses are fired upon and torched, and college-educated students in Ames, Iowa, chant death to all Arabs out their dorm windows. These feelings are understandable. It's difficult not to get carried away at the sight of classmates and neighbors marching off in desert camouflage. And yet, all Arabs includes me, includes my daughters, and words alone can do damage. To say that gunmen and arsonists don't know any better, any better may or may not be stating the obvious. But the chanting students, as understandable as their feelings are, and despite their college educations, I must conclude that they too simply don't know any better. Just as I had to conclude years ago when I was mocked for speaking with an accent and thinking my thoughts in another language. Those students, smart as they are, need to get out of their own shoes for a while. Reading stories can help them to do that. Most fiction if it's any good at all, asks that the reader use at least some measure of empathy, that particularly human faculty whereby one can appreciate what an experience must feel like for someone else. The reluctance to feel empathy can express itself in intolerance for the unfamiliar, in self-preoccupation and narcissism. At the very least, it hinders maturation. It's children who stomp on anthills, the emotionally stunted who douse cats in gasoline. Empathy, on the other hand, has a maturing effect and leads us into the world. I make an appeal to that empathy as well as to a larger sense of us in this selection from Lebanese Blonde, which I will find right here. This excerpt addresses the is there an us question most directly. And it takes place after a Sunday dinner. The extended family is watching a 60 Minutes program about the war escalating in Beirut. Remember, this is 1975. <coughs> Excuse me. As the camera begins showing some of the children, child victims, a phone call interrupts. It's the hospital, Uncle Waxy, who's a main character, one of the main characters, has regained consciousness, he'd been sick, and there's a, everybody rushes uh, for cars to go to the hospital. Our two uh, main characters, uh, Abudi and Samir, are in the car driving, Samir's driving, and in the back seat are three of the older ladies, uh, Waxy's wife, uh, and uh, Samir's mother is one of them. Listen, bud, Sam said. What we just saw on TV, those car bombs, one of them went off in the Hamra district, close to the American embassy. The announcer said the State Department's already begun tightening travel restriction to Lebanon. So? So you think something like that isn't going to cause a serious hitch? What they're doing is setting up a, a, a plan to uh, sneak in, uh, smuggle in uh, hashish uh, from Lebanon. In the back seat, the women had gone totally silent with listening. Sam feels that if the civil war breaks out in Lebanon, it's going to ruin their smuggling plans. Not us. A booty waved away the very idea. It's not in our blood. What's that supposed to mean? We're business people. Look at Beirut, built on international banking. Look at our history. Overseas traders, merchants, way back before Bible times even. Sam thought he heard a grunt of approval from the back seat. So what, he said. 
So look at the news we're seeing now, and not that State Department crap. I mean news from the street. Some poor chump's grocery store gets blown to bits, and two days later, two days later, he's selling melons out of a push cart, and he's turning a profit. They're business people over there, cuz, and business people don't let things stay bad, not for long anyway. Unless the war itself happens to be the business. What's that supposed to mean? Come on, Abudi. Don't you think somebody's got to be making money off all this? We are beastful beebles. Aunt Afifi couldn't resist adding her two cents. In the rear view, Sam could see her adjusting the volume knob on the listening device hanging at her bosom. I had an, an aunt who did she had a, a, she was deaf, and the one went in the ear, and the other thing was hanging here. So when she talked on the phone, she'd hold the receiver like this. It's the funniest thing in the world, especially if you're four years old. Just to see that. That's right, Auntie Abudi said. We are peaceful people. But now Sam's mother also piped up, asserting in Arabic that most truly we are a peaceful people and therefore we can hold up our heads to anyone. I suppose so, Ma, Sam said. Abudi smirked, gave him a little nudge with his elbow. The two women began a running commentary while Aunt Najla, seated between them, nodded in agreement and softly uttered Arabic encouragements. We are a lawful people, e na'am. We are honorable, ma'loom. We don't do it, the shooting and the blowing up, mazboot. No, this the other peoples do, not us. Other people, Sam glanced up into the rear view, like who? His mother was ready with an answer and she smiled. Il Irish, she said. They are on Il CBS every day, Il Irish, not us. Okay, not us. There is no us, Sam used to think, listening to Uncle Yusuf <coughs> excuse me, go on and on about this small country at the great crossroads of East and West that had been repeatedly invaded over thousands of years by anybody and everybody from Egyptians to Macedonians, from Mongols to Turks to European Crusaders. Australians, too, and French Senegalese, Yusuf would hasten to add, recounting how the people of this small country were once natural sailors and pioneers, how they had founded Carthage and Syracuse, colonies on Malta and the coast of France and Spain, and some claimed beyond the Mediterranean, how they circled Africa and even touched, Yusuf firmly asserted, the coast of America, 2,000 years before Columbus. Us who, Sam had concluded. No such thing. Not after all those years and all that mixing. How could there be an us? And yet there is an us. Sam had recognized it this evening, watching those television children stacked in death against a wall, their dark eyes, like the dark eyes of his nephews and nieces, of his own eyes in the old photographs, the whorled curls of their hair like his own hair, the same golden skin, those little white teeth that should be smiling. Oh yes, there is an us. And I'd like to conclude uh, with the conclusion of where I'm from originally, which has a, <coughs> excuse me, un ends with a brief story about a coincidence that I experienced back in 1990 shortly after my collection of short stories through and through Toledo stories first uh, came out. I was invited to give a reading at a bookstore in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'd never been to the Twin Cities before in my life, and I knew no one from there. So I was quite surprised when a total stranger, an older woman, she had a cane and she walked very slowly, from the audience, approached me afterward with a familiar Hello, Mr. Jaha, giving my last name its Arabic pronunciation. What really floored me, though, was her adding, You're one of Elias's boys, aren't you? The littler one they called Zuzu. I hadn't heard myself called Zuzu, the Arabic diminutive for Yusuf, since I was five years old. Entering first grade, I remember how I'd insisted that even at home I'd be called Joe, an American name. It was a shock hearing the first name of my childhood pronounced by a total stranger. 
who, of course, turned out not to be a stranger at all, of course, but a distant cousin who used to visit Toledo regularly years ago, and she remembered my family when we first arrived in America. So now, in a city where I knew no one, I found it was ironically my turn to be asking the question, where did you come from? Here? No, I mean originally. <laughs> Honest to God, this was the conversation that happened. Originally, she replied, I was born in St. Paul, a mile from this spot. I've lived here all my life. Here? Here looked blonder than Iowa and Missouri put together. The odd thing was, the more we chatted, the more it began to make sense. Why couldn't she be one of my people as well as from around here, originally? Why not indeed? After all, who said America must be a melting pot into which we drain and disappear? The 19th century, that's who. The great melting pot has always been a 19th century notion, and I just assume it stayed there along with the know-nothings and manifest destiny. I prefer instead an image I'd come across more and more in recent years, that of the mosaic, the American mosaic. Common sense tells us that the American immigrant experience resulted not from melting down the uniqueness in each separate one of us, but from arranging arranging those pieces and joining them together toward the design of a more complex picture, one that makes use of differences to create richness and power and harmony, the achievement of which is the promise of Ellis Island and in the stories I've written, the struggle for which is what America is all about. Thank you. If you have any questions. So uh, the way we're going to handle questions, because I have to repeat them for the microphone so that we pick them up, is uh, you ask them, I will repeat them, and then Joe will be able, or Zuzu. Can we call you Zuzu now? Uh, should have never, be careful what you put on paper. That's right, yeah. From now on, it'll be Zuzu. Uh, then he will be happy to answer them. So the floor is open. Please go ahead. Don't be shy. I answer questions about anything, by the way. I have a lot of answers. <laughs> Barbara. Uh, how are your girls feel? My daughters? daughters? So let me, let me review the they, question quickly. Do they still carry some of the feeling of not belonging, or have they um, integrated? So the question is about uh, Joe's daughters, sort of, uh, that would be the second generation, and how they feel about be, being integrated or not integrated into this larger American mosaic that Joe was talking about? I think they never felt the separateness. Uh, I think they always felt they always belonged in every room they ever walked into, for one thing. But uh, 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 the way they feel, I would say, is that they're, they're, they're proud of their heritage. And they, uh, one, one of my daughters uh, has taken up uh, Lebanese cooking and was very seriously. Uh, and that's sort of What's left from the culture, you know, is the music and the food, the language goes right away. But uh, so, uh, no, they're, they're proud. They're proud of who they are. And I'm, that pleases me no end. Yes? Do you still get asked where you're from originally? So the question is, does Joe still get asked where he's from originally? When I had hair. <laughs> We're going to get you a wig at this point, Joe. Really? Uh, no, actually, actually, uh, you asked me today where I was from originally, but but that's that's a question everybody gets asked. Uh, no, I meant from where in Lebanon. I knew you. Were. I know. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, no, not 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 so much anymore. But uh, I've uh, turned white here on the. You know, uh... Other and, and people when people ask, they they always meant it in the. Most, you know, it was just an honest question. It wasn't a, a one to, to distance me, you know, or they didn't. I, at least I don't believe they felt they were doing that, you know. Yes. What advice would you give to um, immigrants in today's American society compared to American society when uh, you get immigrated to America? 
So the question is, what advice would Joe give or sort of insight give to immigrants who are coming in today to America instead of the generation that Joe came with? Uh, I, I would give very little advice because their experience, I think, is so different from mine. Uh, the, the generation is, is very different. I can only experience what it feels to be strange in the way that I was experiencing how it was to be a stranger. Uh, as, as, as terms of advice, uh, you know, of course, always the, the whole sense of people aren't really, people are more curious than they're mean, you know. Uh, they they just want to know, you know. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, giving advice to people who have had different experiences from mine is kind of shaky ground anyway, but, you know, beyond the, the general, you know, patience and that kind of a thing. But uh, 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 keep your sense of humor and don't lose who you are, you know, because the, the, the culture really does, uh, I think, want to take us and make us into a homogenous blend. But the, the nice thing about being an immigrant, one of the nice things, is that, yeah, America changes you, but you change America. America looks different from us because of us, you know. Uh, look at the restaurants, you know. Things, we, we come and we change things too. Uh, you know, we sell you Hager slacks. You know? uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a two-way street, and, uh, and I think it's really wrong to forget that. But that's a good question. I, I, I just hesitate giving advice to people who have probably experienced a heck of a lot more than I ever did. All the way in the back. I couldn't hear that. So the question is whether Joe uh, would have preferred a different set of experiences than those questioning him always about his place within American society, or was he, in the end, in a way, satisfied that those experiences, in essence, made him who he is? I assume that's. I, I, uh, if is that's that correct? Your question. Uh, uh, definitely the latter. Uh, I think uh, I think you are who you are because of what you go through and how you approach it, and what you take away from it. Uh, so I, I can't. I, I'd be somebody else, you know. Uh, I, I have a sense of humor, hopefully, and and I, I think I, that part of developing it was in response to the experiences I was having. I needed it, you know, and it, it came in handy. Uh, so. Uh, no, I, I would say uh, I value the experiences that I had. Uh, but, but we can say that about a lot of the painful things that happen in our lives, I think. You know, uh, would you give up this? Well, that means you'd be somebody else. And I, I, would, I would hesitate. I, no, I, I, I'm good with what happened. I don't go back and change a thing. Yes, please. When you first immigrated to the U.S., what made you so new to, or why were you so ready to give up your so the question is, when Joe first immigrated as a child to the United States, what made him so ready to give up his Arab roots or Lebanese background? I, was, I felt hypersensitive to being different. Uh, and, I, and it was really my problem. It really wasn't the, 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 the culture's problem. It was mine. And my problem was that I uh, uh, was, was so sensitive that I just wanted to not be noticed for these particular things. Uh, I, I used to think that my... I, I used to think that Arabic was a secret language that my parents had made up, so that when we went to the gro went to the to the to the uh, store, uh, the department store, and they would say to each other, "Look at the nose on this one," in Arabic, I, I thought it was just so they could have the secret language, so they could do that. You know, I was humiliated. I was humiliated because I thought the Americans understood. They didn't. But you know what? If two people are talking in a foreign language near you, and you think they're talking about you, they are. <laughs> All the way in the back, yes. How do you feel about Arabic now? So the question is, how does Joe feel about Arabic today as a language? As a language? 
Uh, I, I wish I knew more of it. I wish I hadn't lost as much as I did. Uh, when, I was, uh, uh, when I was 26 years old, I went back to Lebanon for a visit. Uh, and I, I told uh, Akram the story that uh, I hadn't used my Arabic in such a long time. I, I stopped essentially when I was five, six years old, and started, except at home. And we developed what was known as kitchen Arabic, which is, you know, instead of su'l sierra, which means drive the car, I was saying things like dar fil kar, you know, making it sound, talking English, but making it sound like you're talking Arabic. It's called kitchen Arabic, but, uh, uh, which is the title of a cookbook I'm going to write. I'm in the process, actually, of writing. But anyway, where was I? Uh, I get lost sometimes. Uh, you were in Zahlib. Oh, yes. I went, back, I went back to the old country, and uh, I have relatives in Damascus. Now, my relatives in Zahli uh, could speak enough English, and we communicated very well. But when I went and visited my relatives, my cousins in Damascus, they understood no uh, English at all. In fact, at one point, one of them asked me something, because I could understand them and everything very well. My Arabic was OK. Uh, they said, uh, asked me something, and, and I answered. I said, do you, they said, do you want this or what? And I said, OK. And they looked at me like they were waiting for my answer still. They did not, did not know what OK was. You know, that's how. So for three, four days, all I spoke was Arabic. And by the third night, I was having my dreams in Arabic. And I had not dreamed in Arabic since I was five, six years old. So it came back to me. I was, uh, I, and of course, since then, uh, I've lost it again. But uh, one of the nice things about that trip was I was able to expand my Arabic vocabulary because uh, until then, it, it stopped at around age five. You know, and you can't do a lot with pee pee poo poo because, you know, it's a lot of baby words for things, you know. I was glad to learn the, the real, the real. Uh, I'd like to jump in just to expand a little bit on what Joe said and back to the question you asked about why would somebody want to move away. I mean, you have to also remember that in that time period, uh, the image of the Arab, just it is today, was, was fairly negative. If you look at Hollywood, if you look at popular media, if you look at any aspect of how Absolutely. Arabs were portrayed, uh, this is, goes back to the 19th century, by the way, all the way into the 20th century, the first Arab movie was called The Sheik in English, or The Sheikh, with Valentino, who was actually Italian-American, portraying this lecherous uh, you know, Arab man whose only thing is to go after white women to basically seduce him and rape him. So the image of being Arab here was very negative altogether. And that image, and I think unlike many other ethnic communities, that image has not been rehabilitated. Uh, in other words, it continues for over a century to be fairly negative, fed, of course, by what happens in the Middle East. So, and if you listen to how Arabic is used in film, which would be the only encounter that people would have had with Arabic at the level of mass media, it was a language that sounded like dogs barking. It was not a language of 2,000 years of civilization. It was not a language of poetry, of philosophy, of science, of rationality, of joy, of hope. It was a language of violence and terrorism, as we call it now. And so I think it's not terribly surprising to, that people moved away from that uh, in that regard. And so I think that's the milieu in which uh, Joe and many other early immigrants found themselves in. I mean, I don't mean to imply yeah, no, the, that no, that's the, his the early, yeah, And the early immigrants were mostly Christian Lebanese. And it was very important to the Christian Lebanese to uh, assimilate. My father uh, did not want us to live uh, uh, right in the uh, Arab American community in Toledo. Uh, he wanted us to, to speak English at home as soon as we could. He encouraged us to go to the movies and listen to the radio, because television was still on in its infancy at that time. But to, to keep the radio on all the time, because he wanted us to blend in. And that was part of that drive as well. Okay. Other questions? Yes? In what ways did the Christian Lebanese community differ from the Muslim Lebanese community? And did the civil war in Lebanon cause any differences? So the question is about the, the difference between and the experiences of Lebanese, uh, Christian Lebanese and Muslim Lebanese, uh, or as they were called, by the way, then Syrians in general who are immigrated early on in the 20th century. I assume you're talking about the early period. Uh, was there a difference in the experiences and did the war in Lebanon in 1975, which lasted for about 15 years, 
until 1990, did that have an impact on how the two different religious communities dealt with, uh, with that or with a sense of identity? The, uh, the, uh, the Christians were uh, first. They came, uh, they started coming, uh, well, I should say the majority of the immigrants were Christian, uh, in, uh, starting in, say, the 1890s, uh, moving on up to the Quota Act in the, in the mid early 20s. Uh, the, uh, then after World War II, uh, the, uh, if I'm correct, uh, I think I am, uh, it was primarily uh, a Muslim uh, immigration. Uh, the, did, did we feel different about them? Is that what you're, uh, the, the, the war in Lebanon? Oh, do, you, do you think it means, oh, oh that we have like, I have resentment against the, oh, okay. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. No, I, uh, Well, I, I would say their, their experience probably was different and is different. I mean, just if, if, primarily because of the politics of the day. Uh, uh, the, 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 the Syrian uh, immigrants, and actually a lot of them were called Turks too. My dad told me that when he came, it was listed as a Turk from Turkey in, in Asia because it was the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the, uh, they, uh, well, I lost the question. I'm sorry. So sorry. Per perhaps I can jump in just for just a little clarification. So we don't really know the statistics. We assume that the majority of the people who came here between 1880, which is when you really begin to see significant numbers, all the way to 1920, the majority certainly were Christian, either uh, Roman Catholic, Maronite, or Greek Orthodox or uh, Greek Catholic. So the majority would have been there, but they certainly were not the whole bunch. Uh, what was advantageous, especially as it became more and more difficult for people from the region to enter into the United States, was to tell a story of persecution. So like uh, most of the folks would be get on a boat in Beirut, arrive in southern France in Marseille. There they would tell them, look, when you arrive in Ellis Island, say that the Muslims are persecuting you. Right? Although the reality is, historically speaking, that was not the case. But that was a story to the point where those who were Muslim would say the Muslims are persecuting us. Right? <laughs> So the identity of being Muslim in America was very limited the, because of the concentrations. The two places where we see significant concentrations were Detroit because of the Ford factory. So you see a significant number of Muslims there. In fact, that's the first mosque in America was built there. And then, believe it or not, in North Dakota because uh, homesteading. It's kind of strange, I know, but there's actually small communities of Shiite Muslims in North Dakota. You can still see some of their little tombs, but uh, they couldn't intermarry with fellow Muslims, so ultimately they dwindled. So in general, the narrative has become primarily Christian, even though the numbers are not necessarily that. After 67, there's another wave. That's when 1965, there's an immigration act that opens up. We get rid of the quota system and opens up the immigration. All of a sudden, you see a lot more coming in. Uh, into the United States, primarily, this, as Joe was saying, primarily Muslim. And the relationships are very complex. It's very difficult to summarize them. It depends upon where people ended up. Sometimes they mix, sometimes they don't. Uh, the, you know, sometimes the tensions of politics in the Middle East come across. Sometimes people try to overcome them. So I think it really depended upon the community itself. Uh, I mean, in a place like Raleigh, I think you would find there's a lot of much more intermixing than in some other places, perhaps, like Charlotte. I don't know, but I mean, places like that. So that's, I think, where you would see the differences. Farazda? Uh, over the years, how much Arabic have you reacquired or relearned? Have I reacquired? No. Not much. So Not the question much. is about how much Arabic did you reacquire over the years? I don't think that works that way with language that you don't use. Yeah. You know, I, I, if I... Don't uh, ask him for cuss words, though. He knows them all. My father, I, I, uh, my father used to pay me dimes to say Arabic cuss words. You know, he'd, say, he'd tell me what to say, he'd give you a dime, and, and I'd say it, and he'd give me the dime. Oh, my mother would go nuts. But, uh, yeah, my father liked to do that. Yes, all the way back there, my daughter.
Yeah. So the question is, were there moments in American history and Joe's personal history in which it feel, felt easier to be part of America and other moments when it was much more difficult to be part of this America yes. that is blonde and blue-eyed? Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I, 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 experienced, uh, I experienced some of that uh, uh, when, when political tensions really flared up. Uh, the first time I remember that, and uh, it was uh, right after the 67 war, actually while the 67 war was going on, uh, and, uh, and someone uh, that we, we had had a, uh, in, in, in among the faculty, and I was a graduate student at the time, uh, decided not to have uh, lunch with us because uh, concerns for how they would uh, feel about me being there. And, and that, that felt real weird, very strange, and, uh, and I was very angry at her for that. Uh, yeah, so it, it has happened. Uh, but it was not the majority of my experience at all. I mean, I think you would, you would probably guess that in later times, especially after 9-11, the experience with Arab Americans has become much more tense, uh, of course. And so, I mean, there are these crisis moments in the Middle East that do feed into what it means to be, you know, an Arab American within the United States or a Muslim American, for that matter. Well, also, it depends on the America you're in. In Ames, Iowa, you don't hear it as plainly as you do in, say, more blue-collar areas, uh, where uh, the, certain attitudes are expressed more bluntly. Yeah. Yeah. All the way at the back. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. You have to speak a little louder. I'm kind of deaf. How did you relate to your parents growing up? And um, how, did, how did you mourn? And how did your parents mourn the legacy of the legacy So the question is how you related to your parents yeah. uh, growing up and how did they sort of, how did they keep maintain a sense of Lebanese identity? Is that the? How did they mourn like, the loss of Lebanese identity? Oh, okay. And how did they uh, mourn? Okay, sure. Uh, uh, they didn't think very much about things. You know, uh, they uh, they were reflective. Uh, they they're, they're more the kind who stood around and said, "Well, what happened? <laughs> you know, did somebody turn the lights out?" Uh, they they, uh, uh, they they wouldn't look at it like that. Uh, uh, my uh, my father wanted us to integrate. Uh, I think he would be very proud that I you know uh, went on into get more education. That was very important to him that I do that. And uh, uh, my mother, I think, was, uh, she, she didn't look at it. She just, this was the, uh, it's like asking a fish about water. This is wh wh what she lived in. This is what she was. She didn't think about it. Uh, so uh, I'd say she adjusted to herself just fine. Well, I think also you have to understand that there's space. I mean, right now we live in the multicultural United States where there are spaces for us to express and explore <coughs> and reflect. And this goes back to the original question about different time periods. And there are moments in which to do so was only to identify yourself more as an other. And you really didn't want to do that as much, right? So I mean, it, you may have the questions internally, but to verbalize these questions is to place yourself in juxtaposition to this massive society that is saying, we don't want you to be different. You cannot be different. So I mean, I think there's this shift in America is really significant in that regard. And I think yeah. in many ways, it's partly because of this Believe it or not, because the 1965 Immigration Act really changed the face of America, uh, because it allowed a huge number of people to come in all of a sudden. But in addition, we also always had that idea that at least I was raised with and my cousins were raised with was the idea that we don't do this, the American do that. Uh, so there was a sense of us. Uh, there was a sense of, uh, uh, no, we don't do that. Sort of what my, my, the old ladies in the back seat of the car are talking about. Where we, we don't do that, other people do that kind of a thing. So there was a sense of that, too. L'American is the Arabic term for Americans, right? Yeah. You can probably guess that just from yeah. the sound, but that's what it is. All right, mm -hmm. yes? Um, so you've spoken mostly about how you felt different uh, when you were in the United States. Were there any aspects of American culture that you felt like you felt welcome or you felt like you, like you belonged? I know for me, some of my first interactions with immigrants were uh, playing on a soccer team. I feel like that was a good aspect there because there, above all, we are on the same team. You're a member of this team. It's sort of a bonding force. Yeah. For being different doesn't matter. Did you have? I think sports. Uh, has, that's one of the best qualities about sports. 
uh, especially in terms of this kind of an experience. Yeah. No, I never had that. Uh, 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 that I would say that I was most welcomed where I did well, which was in the in the university in the academic, uh, and and uh, and and pretty much uh, it didn't ma it didn't seem to matter to my friends as much as it seemed to matter to me, whether they were in the academia or not. It didn't seem to matter as that. As I said before, it was my problem, you know. Yes, all the way in the back. So the question is whether there are any moments in which not only did you feel outside mainstream America, but you also felt outside mainstream Arab society within yeah. America. Yeah. Yeah, personal angst. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, and, and that, and, and again, those are problems that I had to deal with for myself, uh, and I, I can't lay that at the feet of the, the one culture or the other, uh, because, in a sense, because of the route I took, which was to try and find my own way, uh, and, and very often that'll leave you with this person upset and that person upset, and you're kind of in the middle and. Sometimes best just to step back and let them collapse on each other. But uh, no, uh, yeah, I, I, that's a good question. And uh, I, yeah, I think anybody who, who tries to find their own way experiences that a lot. I think maybe we should point out, too, that there are lots of differences among the various Arabic countries. The languages uh, are quite different. Many of the cultural activities and mores are different also mm -hmm. among the Arab countries. So, the so Lebanese, the Lebanese uh, people had the French influence and had been under French mandate before mm -hmm. you came. Yeah, from and, 1919. Uh, that had some, some influence on the people who came to America because they had some Western ideas, many of them. So the point that's being made is that uh, the Arab world is not a singular entity. So if you go to a place like Morocco, then you go to a place like Lebanon, then you go to a place like Kuwait, there are fairly vast differences in terms of the culture and even the language and what have you. And the point also was that Lebanon becomes a mandate. The, the reality is, though, that most of the immigrants who come here come before the mandate. So the French had no influence on them whatsoever. And most of the immigrants come from villages where the French had very little, if any, influences. There is no doubt in the 19th century, the French missionary schools and some American missionary schools do that. But the majority of the immigrants were farmers. And as such, as Joe was indicating about his family, uh, they really were not westernized in any real sense, per se. Uh, so when they arrive here, they arrive very much as folks coming off the village. Now, those who come after 1967, the second wave, Yes, I think they are much more exposed. Their language, their culture, their understanding of the West is much more common. That's very true. Uh, wait, go ahead. Um, when you started incorporating your personal experience in your writing, um, where did you find yourself learning to communicate in your Christian writing? So the question is, when Joe first started sort of of his stories and his novels, where did he start? Where did this process start of sort of identifying who he is as a character and putting himself into the story? I can tell you exactly. Uh, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I uh, had, as I said in my essay, been trying to distance myself from all that. And then when I physically distanced myself from all that, I suddenly began to want to cook certain things and uh, you know, to have certain tastes. and uh, It all began to mean so much more to me. And then suddenly I, I would have these, these memories that would come to me about uh, my father's grocery store. Uh, sometimes I'd see it in dreams. Uh, and uh, and it, was, it, it really meant something to me. And so I started writing about that, really just describing the street. And suddenly I found that, oh, I do want to talk about this. So it's, it's sort of, I, I went by feel. And, and I went, when it felt good, I went there. You know, and I think that's probably, I think that's probably advice for any kind of writing. You know, when it feels like it's answering something, it's good for, go that way. You know. 
Gary? Your presentation of the character who asked you where you're from originally is gentle. Yeah. Did you struggle with that? Did, were you attempted to lampoon or skewer him? Oh, uh, I have to watch that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can, and it's easy to do, but in all fairness, he, was, he, wouldn't, he wasn't deserving of that. Uh, he, 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 he did not put himself in my shoes to think that I may have been asked that so many times because obviously a guy who looked like I did back then would have been asked that so many times. Uh, so uh, it's easy to do that, but uh, also uh, when you're writing something uh, that other people are going to read, uh, that may, uh, you, you want to be fair, you know, and, and I wanted to be fair to him with, and still make him a little funny, so I made him a dentist. I don't know what he was, but I can still kind of see his face, even after all these years. Uh, and uh, and he, I, I think maybe he was a dentist. <laughs> Shake. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you for coming. So the question is, uh, uh, Shay was asking about that one episode that Joe mentioned about getting on the bus in Toledo and contra contrasting it with Ames, Iowa, in which on that bus you will hear, in essence, the United Nations in terms of the people coming from all sorts of places. And so her question is, uh, the whole talk was really about placing himself vis-a-vis -vis the larger mainstream white America. Did he ever sort of place himself within other ethnic communities, Italians, Jewish communities, Polish, and does that create a sense of identity that's different than mainstream white America? Yeah, I was very drawn to uh, when, when someone would recognize or, or uh, discover or share some aspect of a cultural heritage that was different than mine. For some reason, I'm very interested in that because when you've been through something, you want to know, how was it for you? This is how it was for me. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm... I'm I have a friend uh, who's Greek, you know, and we have the same words for a lot of things in food-wise anyway. And he had a grandmother who, he told me a story about something she did, and I wrote it down word for word and published it. It was, the, it was such a, a Lebanese story, but he was Greek. And it was, uh, uh, and then my Uncle Louis ran a, uh, a grocery store uh, right between the Arab community and the Polish community and he made the best kielbasa uh, in the city. People would come from all over because he had a good recipe from someone who knew what they were doing. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, yeah, the, we shared a lot. And, and, uh, and I, I'm drawn to it personally because I, I know what my experience was. I'd like to know what someone else, you know, how was it for you, you know? And I think that's, that's one of the draws of fiction. You know, that it tells us uh, I had a feeling, I did, I did a, uh, I had an experience, uh, and then, you know, it's not just you. It kind of breaks through the loneliness, uh, and you can, uh, you know, realize that there are others who, uh, who share this. And, and, that, and as I said before, that expands your sense of empathy, you know. Uh, uh, I know what it's like to hurt. Uh, gee, it must feel like that for somebody else, you know, or to feel joy. So I think we will conclude here with this last question. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, I'm sure Joe would take your individual questions. Also, there are copies of his books if you'd like him to, uh, to autograph it. I'm sure he would like to do it for 20 bucks. Uh, so, and, uh, write anything you want. Yeah, that's right, anything you want. So uh, thank you again for being with us tonight. We really appreciate that, and we hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you again soon. And you Be were, safe as you travel. And wait, you, you were a terrific audience. A really terrific audience. Thank you. Thank you. And my students, a joke.